It is now our pleasure to welcome two people who have been uh, truly outspoken about the place of Black businesses and Black economic empowerment. Uh, John Rogers, the co-CEO of Ariel Investments, the oldest and first African-American-owned asset management firm, and Robert Smith, the founder, CEO, and chairman of Vista Equity Partners. Robert John, thank you so very, very much to you both for joining us. Pleasure to be here. here. John, you know, I, I think we're going to start off this conversation with you. I mean, you, you've spoken uh, eloquently uh, and with extraordinary uh, passion and detail about uh, not only the, the economic health of Black America, a, a topic that uh, Dr. Rouse had introduced uh, the, the conference with earlier, but also the, the state of Black businesses. Um, what are you seeing today yeah, and what has been its trajectory, as as you can view it, uh, over the last couple of years? Well, when it comes to um, black business, you know, I'm fortunate to be from Chicago, where we were seen as the mecca of African American businesses. And when I got home from college, we had these extraordinary businesses that were doing so well 40 years ago. You know, you had the largest black bank in the country, Independence Bank. You had Johnson Publishing, which was an extraordinary business with, you know, Ebony and Jet and all the historic things they did. You had Johnson Products. They had Afro Sheen and Ultra Sheen and over 500 employees in this beautiful factory on the south side. It was extraordinary. Um, today, all those businesses are gone. You know, we've lost it all. And when you look at the Cranes list in Chicago, they list the top 150 uh, privately held businesses in Chicagoland every year. 20 years ago, roughly, we had three of the top 150 companies. You know, not great, but 2%. Now we have zero of the top 150 companies uh, are African-American. You know, zero out of 150 privately held companies. So we have gone backwards substantially. Uh, there are really no African-American businesses of scale in Chicago. And there are, most of us are just rounding errors relative to our majority peer groups. I would say Robert Smith is the one exception of a business that's out there that's gotten to scale uh, nationally, but very, very few companies have. And the last data point I would just say is, you know, when it comes to college educated blacks, you know, we have been going backwards dramatically. You know, Ray Bashar and the St. Louis Fed has this great data that shows between 1992 and 2016, College-educated African Americans saw our wealth decline 10 percent, while college-educated whites saw their wealth increase 96 percent. So it just shows you when it comes to economic growth and business growth, we are going backwards very rapidly. You know that is such a critical uh, intervention. It, it's an important intervention, uh, particularly when you think about the, the arc of of, of history, um, and, and you think about. You know, what it means to to have a a black institution to have a, a, a to have black businesses not just um, black CEOs in, in in other institutions but to have institutions from and by uh, their communities uh, Robert when, when you listen to this particular overview and this trajectory which is you know certainly uh, one that that requires a lot of attention, uh, where do you see the specific place of black banks? I mean, we're, we're, we've heard about a little bit of the decay of, again, black businesses, but, but where do black banks fit in this particular story? Uh, thanks, Chris. The critical part of being in business uh, in America that is missing in our community is access to capital. Uh, John and I fight literally every day uh, to access capital. And, you know, and we have businesses of size and scale and capacity. Uh, nearly 70% of black neighborhoods do not have a, black, uh, a, a branch bank. Um, in, in Denver, Colorado, and in my neighborhood, which was an all black neighborhood, um, you know, middle class, you know, striving individuals, many of the businesses were owned uh, by the people in the community. There was not a bank or a branch bank in our community. And what we have now seen, of course, is nearly half the black owned banks have closed in the last decade. Uh, and the collective capitalization of those remaining is 25% lower than it was uh, in 2008, 2009. And credit is an important part of building capacity, uh, economic capacity in our communities. It's important to spur uh, entrepreneurship, 
um, to create, uh, you know, a people to give thought to taking risk and growing businesses and hiring uh, ultimately people within their communities. And the prior session talked about the, you know, CDFIs and MDIs are, are critical in that regard. Well, when we, you know, encountered the, the dynamic that the pandemic, uh, you know, brought forward that black banks and black communities were not getting access to, you know, PPP loans, and we had the good fortune of, of getting the, the ear of many of our uh, uh, senators, including um, at the time, Senator Kamala Harris and, and uh, Senator Warner, uh, Senator Schumer, et cetera. And uh, we also had uh, access to um, uh, Treasurer Mnuchin at the time. Uh, we were able to get capital carved out for our CDFIs and MDIs, but it also laid bare the fact that our CDFIs and MDIs are uh, frankly, underinvested from their technology. A uh, modern bank is essentially a technology company, and investments in tech infrastructure are critical in order for our banking infrastructure uh, to be able to deliver capital to the small and medium businesses in our communities. And that's something that has to be addressed, addressed now. Uh, there are some barriers to that that we have to work through, um, but there are very large tech companies uh, that are focused on how do we actually do that. And we've got some initiatives through our you know, six cities, southern cities initiatives to, to modernize about two dozen of these CDFIs and MBIs to make a more efficient delivery of capital uh, into our community. And that is essential. It is critical. And that is a lifeblood to any entrepreneur is access to capital. You know, I'm going to return to that topic in just a second in terms of, you know, the technology and technology rails for, for banks. But but just sticking with the the, the, the general question about the the fact that we now, post-pandemic, uh, lead to, we're all living in a digital economy right now. Digitization, um, the electronification of the economy is now a reality. It's not something that you can I I ignore. Uh, John, when you hear uh, Robert's points about technology, do they strike a chord with you about not just banks, but really the general positioning of Black businesses overall? Uh, again, especially after a year in which most of us have found ourselves at home. Well, it's interesting as you know, in this last year of COVID, the businesses that African Americans are in primarily, you know, construction, retail, uh, catering, we've been devastated by COVID. Folks that are in the technology world, the digital world, uh, money management world, finance world, we've been able to do well in this horrific year for our country and the tragedy of George Floyd. You know, we've been able to, you know, hold our own. So it brings up this point that I think is so, so important. Our economy has evolved over the last 40 years or more from a kind of a manufacturing based economy to now a professional services, financial service, technology and media based economy. And we haven't moved with it when it comes to our community and economic opportunity for us. And part of the problem is this term supplier diversity. Whenever a progressive institution, anchor institution, university, hospital, corporation wants to do business with black people, they think about supplier diversity and they think about construction and catering and janitorial services, which are very important businesses. But those have the lowest margins, the least amount of growth and the least wealth being created there. We need to move that term supplier diversity into a modern terminology of business diversity. That's what the University of Chicago uses. We're now the University of Chicago works with 90 professional services and technology firms with their spend here in Chicago. And why can't all institutions make that leap? Because otherwise, I say it's a modern day Jim Crow if the black and brown people can only do the catering and the construction and the white men get to do the technology, be a part of this digital world, have the venture capital firms, have the private equity firms, have the hedge funds and heads up of all the other kind of professional and financial services that are out there. So we have to transition. We want to bring wealth to our community. We have to be able to participate in the parts of the economy where the wealth is being created today. And I can't overemphasize how important that is. Supplier diversity is like blockbuster video versus Netflix. <laughs> you know, you know, it, the, the, essential wisdom uh, and, and, and understanding that the, the overall ecosystem has to be one. And, and I began this conference by saying that Black people have the same right to uh, high quality, cutting edge financial services as anyone else and, and to expect the best from our policy community 
and, and also to, to expect the best and to support uh, local uh, communities. Uh, Robert, you know, when, when you hear this, what kinds of steps do you think uh, are needed to upgrade the, the technology rails of banks? I mean, you know, technology is a big term. And you can think of a million different areas of technology from uh, alternative data and credit scoring to, uh, you know, open banking to blockchain technology. I mean, you name it, regulate, you know, regulatory compliance, AML, you know, KYC. I mean, th th there's a lot to technology and there's a lot of innovation really at almost every point in the supply chain of the provision of financial services. You know, what kinds of where do, where do you start, you know, when, when you think about upgrading uh, black banks? Yeah, I think it, it is um, quite simply the, the most important thing that one can do is build out what I call their core banking and lending management uh, capacity. Uh, we've actually scoped out with, with, with Microsoft, you know, a cloud-based set of solutions that said, okay, if we were going to take all the MBIs and CDFIs that are in our communities, what's the what's the scope? It's about a half a billion dollars, five hundred twenty-four million dollars to be to be precise. And if you think about the twelve billion dollars that's been carved out, you know, part of my mind should be let's carve out the twelve, you know, five hundred uh, million of that to actually modernize these banks. You know, when you modernize these banks, you actually have lending velocity uh, and capacity to now start to to create more efficient lending. Uh, again, these are small loans in many cases to the small and medium businesses in the communities. Uh, when you have a community that doesn't have a branch bank, doesn't have a relationship, modernizing that banking infrastructure actually gives you reach and gives you access to those, those, those small to medium businesses. And then they have access where they actually now create a relationship and it's a digital relationship, one that they, you can actually evaluate, you know, how that business has been performing. And just to, to finalize that, you then have to modernize uh, the underlying infrastructure of these small to medium businesses. You know, when you actually implement a, a uh, enterprise software solution in a small business, it's about a 900% return on investment. There aren't very many investments on the planet that have that sort of return. So I think we have to take a holistic view and understanding that the world has moved to this fourth industrial revolution, everything is being digitized, and we need to enable our small to medium-sized businesses, African-American, Latinx businesses, to compete globally. But in order to do that, we have to enable them. We have to make sure they have broadband access, and we have to ensure that their banking access is actually uh, one that is efficient with uh, and decrease the friction, and that's through a modernization effort. Right. I, I guess, then, you know, as, as we turn to that modernization effort, um, you know, we, we heard uh, uh, earlier, and and today it was announced. You know, an expansion of the CDFI fund, but a lot of the 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 support, particularly for Black banks, will will also um, come from the private sector. You know, uh, are Black banks a good investment? And John, I'll I'll start it off with you. I mean, uh, uh, you are one of the well, you're both one of the I mean, two of the premier investors in the country. Um, you know, are Black banks a good investment? And if so, or if not, uh, why? Well, I think black banks can be a very, very good investment. And I think as we as a community start to think about ways that we can invest with each other, invest with, with, each, with each other's banks, with each other's mutual funds, all the different asset classes that are out there, we can be supportive of each other. But I would say one of the things about black banks, and I've been having this conversation for the last 38 years since I started Ariel, there's no reason why black banks can't expand into the parts of the uh, financial sector where really wealth is created today. If you think about it, the big white banks have investment banking operations. They have often uh, wealth management platforms. They've diversified broadly, so they're not just dependent on lending money. They have these other parts of their arsenal that help them build wealth for their companies. So that's what we need to do as black banks. We want to be successful at black banks. We should be diversifying into wealth management, into investment banking, uh, maybe into money management, all the different aspects of the ecosystem where the big banks are, we should be able to be there too, because we have the talent to be great, but we shouldn't be so narrowly focused. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's 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 really uh, useful. Uh, and, you know, Robert, when you when you hear that, you know, are are black banks good good investments? And you hear about these other allied areas, and in a technology economy, you can think of a number of of allied areas. You know, I was thinking the other day about big data and how minority communities have a certain kind of data that others don't have you know well, like what does that necessarily mean but again for, for, from your standpoint are are black banks good investments 
Uh, they, and to John, John hit it right on the head. They, they can be. There's, there's uh, a couple of elements, like every ecosystem has a strata. Uh, when I think about the CDFIs and MDIs, you know, one thing they need more is either grant or tier one capital. Every dollar that an MDI gets as tier one capital gives them $8 to lend versus, oh, let me put a deposit into that into that bank. And that, and that, of course, creates a liability for the bank. They can only lend basically off of the profits. So to some extent, yeah, we have to in, in, ensure that we inject capital in the right places. Tier one, we have to inject capital into modernization because these banks actually have access to these entrepreneurs and a, and a, and a vast swath of them. So when you think about that, that gives you the ability to say, oh, now you see a business that's growing, you know, $10 million, $30 million in, in growing 30, 40% because they've been modernized. Well, that's when you start to bring in other investment services, investment banking services, which actually enable those small to medium businesses uh, to grow. You know, I, I have a friend who manages about a 14, 14,000, you know, African-American entrepreneurs in an ecosystem. Less than a third of those are actually banked by traditional banking sources. You know, they are looking for venture capital and other sources. So, you know, the, the, the market is there, the opportunity is there, but you have to get the modernization and you have to put capital in the right forms at the right levels, which frankly, for those banks is really tier one capital and equivalent for the CDFIs where they can actually lend it effectively. Last point. You know, they, you know, the CDFIs and MDIs have shown me in, in the minority communities, they actually have a lower default rate than the FDI insured um, uh, overall uh, group of banks. So actually on a risk return basis, it actually makes a lot of sense. Their values often are a little smaller uh, in terms of the lending, but you have to build an infrastructure in order for that to man be managed effectively. Yeah, you know, and that's it. You know, how do you develop you know, that kind of infrastructure to service those particular needs of of minority communities, you know, and, and can you leverage that into some kind of competitive a advantage is I think going to be one of the, the, the key issues that not only the private sector is going to have to think about, but, but also the, the public sector and, you know, just closing that, that thought out, you know, when you have regulatory requirements uh, saying you can't discriminate, you know, and, you know, well, well, is there something that these institutions know that even white institutions uh, can learn from? Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you, the, the language in the, the $12 billion carve out is still unclear as to whether that capital be, can, can be deployed for modernization or versus capital for lending. And I think it would be ideal for the administration to actually be very clear about that. And if they were, I mean, this would this would really open the door to really getting capital into our communities. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you so uh, very, very, very much. Uh, you know, economic uh, empowerment is, is, is obviously um, very much uh, in line with why we <laughs> celebrate emancipation and, and, and empowerment is about uh, independence and, it, and it's obviously about uh, our, our communities. Thank you so much to you both for taking the time out to, to speak with us. Uh, it's been a unique dialogue. Uh, uh, perhaps far too uncommon a dialogue and, and, and very much a valuable one. Uh, again, uh, to you both, thanks so much for dropping in and, and sharing your insight uh, for this conversation. We'll Great. now turn Great. to our- Thank you. Uh, Brown. Thank you.